Hello, and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here in beautiful northern Namibia. And we're near the town of Apuo, and I just spent the last few days with the Land Rover team evaluating the new Defender. And I'm here with two very interesting folks, people that I think can really shed some insights into overland travel, especially in remote locations like this. We have David Sneath who is the expedition leader for this particular trip, and Emma Easter, who handles a lot of the logistics for this kind of expedition. And they're going to talk about what they've learned, the lessons that they've learned along the way from these kinds of expeditions. Now, both of them are extremely experienced. Imagine having a full-time job of introducing others to new vehicles as they come to market, and in particular, Land Rover who has this storied history of exploring the world with their vehicles. And they've always done it this way. They've always been very well planned in their logistics. And I think that there's a lot of lessons that we can take away from that. So thank you, both Emma and David, for being on the podcast today. You're welcome. Good to see you. Absolutely. So, David, you have had a long history with Land Rover. How long have you been working for uh, Land Rover? Over 40 years now. Oh, that's, fan- that's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that alone says so much about the organization, that you can maintain a passion for a brand like that for so long. Yes, it's been an extraordinary uh, experience throughout. It obviously, it has its highs and lows, but uh, yeah. It uh, it gets it gets under your skin. It's a passion. <laughs> no, I can I can see that. And we were having a conversation before the podcast started, and your career included you being an engineer on yes. multiple. Uh, so I was an apprentice, and then became an engineer. Worked in engineering for twenty two, twenty three years, then moved on into marketing. And and you you got your chops the hard way. I mean, you started with P thirty eight, which would have been a challenging thing, and then you helped design the Mark three Range Rover, which I think was one of the best Range Rovers ever built for both that combination of capability and luxury. Yes, it was a, a transformation in the in the Range Rover brand, and I, I suppose my key role was to maintain its ability to cover some of the difficult terrain as well as improving the on-road performance. So, Yeah, it was shocking to see, I mean, it, it for a luxury SUV to start to see locking rear differentials. And if I recall, the first, the early Mark III Range Rovers had exceptional articulation and wheel travel, which was unheard of in the class. Yes, no, that that was uh, the real first introduction of independent suspension with the air suspension combination and such things as cross-link valves between the front axle and the rear axle, as in side to side, uh, really gave us that uh, capability. And that that would create this forced articulation. So as as the one wheel was compressing, it was forcing air pressure into the downward wheel so it- yes i mean basically the way it worked was at a certain speed the link valve would open which would allow the airbag on the side of uh, the car that was being pushed up into the wheel arch to go further because the air had somewhere to go and that pushed the air into the spring on the opposite side of the axle mm. which then meant that you 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 always had contact with the ground with your tires and that makes sense and then at a certain speed you wouldn't want that to happen because you'd get a lot of bo- body roll force yeah. body roll force body roll <laughs> yeah. out, out of the vehicle because obviously the breadth of capability or the dynamics uh, was was key to us as well yeah what a, what an interesting vehicle and what a a series of interesting vehicles you both have worked on. And Emma, you've been with Land Rover, you said, for about four years now. Yes. And you are, you're handling a lot of logistics and planning. So get, give the listener a scope of what is involved for you with planning an expedition into northern Namibia in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, we do roll it right back to 18, 12 months where we look at the car, what attributes do we want to show, all of that. We work with our engineering team, our product team. And then we look at the location and what road routes we want to do and what location is going to suit the car. So we do, you know, we talk amongst ourselves and then we do some desktop research about the countries and political state and everything like that. And then a few of us narrow it down to, you know, where where is where's going to be the best. And then we go out on our recce's and actually see the places. David looks at the road routes. He finds something good. We look at the venues. We look at airports. Can we get people in and out oh, easily? Sure. Like all the finite details. Because if you can't get people into the country easily, then yeah, you're not going to have an event. 
Yeah, it was so impressive <clears throat> to watch how how well everything ran. In fact, yesterday morning, David, you said we're going to get into camp around 630. And I looked at my watch and we arrived at 632. Now, it's not that we were on this purely scripted adventure yesterday. We we went down towards the skeleton coast. We went up a river basin. We had vehicles that were stuck. We were doing winching and kinetic recoveries. We were stopping for photo shoots and we still arrive within two minutes of your estimation, which I'm sure that that doesn't happen every time. But what it does show me is that there is a lot of intention behind that. And I think that that's something that we can all learn as travelers. We want to allow for serendipity. We want to allow for experiences and adventures to occur. But the more that we plan things, the better likelihood we have that we don't end up with that cascade of events where people start to get tired and they start to make poor judgments. Uh, What are some of the things that you have found, David, in planning these trips that allows you to make sure that people aren't being overtaxed, the vehicle isn't being overtaxed, et cetera? Um, For me, there are three things. One is preparation. It's all down to preparation. So it's people preparation and vehicle preparation. If you look at people, have they had the right training? Have they got the, you know, do they fit into the team? For me, you've got to have a very tight team to be able to deliver this with the intensity that we are here. Yeah. Um, we all need to help each other. So uh, there is no such thing as I, I haven't quite finished yet. Everybody won't sit down until mm. everybody's finished. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, Emma has explained that she's looking after logistics. So when we did lunch for you yesterday, we weren't just sat there waiting to do the next bit of driving. We were helping uh, Emma do what she's trying to do and then vice versa. So that, that's key. So people people prep has Emma. Emma went and who hasn't got a lot of experience in driving in these conditions. So we sent her down to Eastner to allow her to get experience in, mm-hmm. in the cars before she comes. Sure. Um, and how, of- how was that experience, Emma, going through Eastner training? Well, it was epic. It was amazing. But then you come somewhere like this and it doesn't, doesn't necessarily doesn't translate. <laughs> but what we've got at Eastner is, is an amazing experience, but nothing from driving on sand to the mud we experienced these last couple of days. It's just been great and I've been sent out with an instructor here and just learning everything has just been fantastic I've got skills for life now with my driving yeah that's one thing that I think Land Rover has always done an exceptional (coughs) job of is how do you train up people to be able to do these kinds of expeditions and I think back to the camel trophy and how much Land Rover was involved with that how much were you involved with the Camel Trophy, David. Um, I, I was buried in engineering when that was going on, so sure. I just touched the end of uh, Freelander uh, in the Patagonia uh-huh. expedition. Yeah, I was buried in Munich working sure. on the Range Rover, <laughs> uh, but then I, I got involved in the sort of, I suppose, the the, the son or cousin of, as in G fours, G four, sure, G fours, uh, and did did all of those because I'd moved into run Land Rover experience then. So, oh, that would yeah. be what an experience that uh, would have been. Because so you did Bolivia and all of those. Yeah, they they were just phenomenal uh, experiences. But uh, and then we did we've done other programs since then. You know, we've done uh, Argentina with Discovery Three, we did mm. uh, Iceland back in two thousand five, and it snowed. You know, it's uh, sure. Yeah, we, we've had some epic experiences. Yeah. Epic. So, and that's all learning as well. Yeah, yeah it, is, it certainly is. And that, that kind of leads me on to the idea of Land Rover has always prided themselves on doing these expeditions with essentially stock vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. But you do need to upfit them in a way that makes them more safe, potentially more capable, but also where better suited for the conditions mm-hmm. in some ways. I noticed that there were some vehicle accessories that were added, Land Rover accessories, some non-Land Rover accessories. Tell me about how you normally look at how to upfit or prepare these cars for these remote expeditions. Um, well, once you've understood the, the, the base car, the base product, uh, and you've understood the accessories, you then have to look about where you're going. Mm. And, um, you know, if you're in mainland Europe, you wouldn't need to carry an extra spare wheel, for example, because you could have a, a depot where you could get them mm. from. But here we're, we're out from a Puo, which is the last sort of center of uh, logistics that you've yeah. got and we're, we're out for three days <clears throat> and we're going to we're covering over 680 kilometers in pretty arduous conditions and if you need a spare wheel somebody can't run one out to you you've no. got to take everything with you so 
you look at the base car, you look at the accessories that you can get, and then you think, well, what else do I need? So we took, for example, the roof rack. We took the standard roof rack. Uh, and then we said, right, we've got to fit an extra spare wheel up there. A lot of people use straps. Uh, I don't like straps because they wear out quite quickly, especially with the uh, conditions that mm-hmm. we're in. So we developed in-house an extra wheel quick release mechanism. I saw seen, that. Quite good. It goes on the cars. We put high lift jacks on because some of the rivers that we're going through, they're very, very boggy, as you saw yesterday. Mm-hmm. And to be able to lift the car out when you can't winch it because it's sucked in, um, that, that's really important. Uh, and, and how would you, I noticed that there were there were lunettes on the rear of the vehicle, mm-hmm. rear recovery points mm-hmm. that would easily accept mm-hmm. the claw of a high lift. Yeah. How would you lift the front of the vehicle with a high lift? Uh, on a monocoque, I don't like using a, I mean, high lift jacks, as sure. you know, sure. uh, are lethal bits of equipment in sure. inexperienced hands. Right. And so what we have, we have the wheel lift. So that we makes put sense. that through the spokes. Yeah, so it's pushing sense. on the top of the rim and I suppose, yeah, not the last resort, but yeah, you, you've got to be really stuck to be wanting to use one of those. And I noticed that yesterday when we were doing vehicle recoveries, you guys brought along a long recovery rope. Now, it looked like it was um, a, it was a dynamic rope, but it wasn't a kinetic energy rope. Correct. Uh, kinetic energy ropes, uh, and we do have them for the deep sand, are, uh, again, can be you have to respect them with a great deal of respect yeah they're less precise for sure yeah and so therefore uh we have three sizes of rope we have a meter short short one uh five meter and then 10 meters so you saw us use our 10 meters yesterday Mm. um and there's a certain amount of give in those ropes sure um and that allows for delicate removal sure Uh, and i saw that with the one vehicle the vehicle that you did yesterday that was great yeah so i mean it's you know yesterday we used the front recovery point which is sort of 65 kilonewton capacity Mm -hmm. so it can take a snatch Mm -hmm. but why do that because you know there's a lot of mass flying around sure uh, and of course you guys are very keen to watch what's going on so i've i've got to manage the safety of all of those recovery sure. situations and you guys did a great job of that you had good hand signals very clear communication the, rec- the all of the spotting was also very excellent as well you know roll down the windows listen to the verbal commands you guys had very clear hand signals in addition and then on the on the winching recovery i also noticed that uh, you guys were working in concert on that as well yeah and you you had an external operator of the winch controller as opposed to the driver of the other vehicle what was some of the motivation behind that strategy uh, i think when you're uh, using a vehicle to recover another vehicle in the mm-hmm. instance that we had yesterday it is far better because you're making sure that you're paying the rope on Sure. Uh, in, in a neat fashion because you're able to with watch the winch it. installation you've got it is sort of in a, inside a post box because it's a, a covered winch it's not quite as easy and if you've got the people then you should use them and, mm-hmm. it, and every recovery for me is a training opportunity to make sure so you know for example Ammo's mm-hmm. never winched in uh, before uh, and probably wouldn't in the office as it were sure. mm-hmm. she's been sat in the vehicle and she's been helping us with that you know putting your foot in the brake keeping the engine RPM up to make sure, sure that battery isn't being depleted you know, always learning always learning and, and I think you saw the recovery yesterday where the car was completely bogged it was in very gloopy soil sand gravel and you've got to communicate with the driver that's trying to drive the uh, vehicle that's being extracted out at the same time so sure. it's key to have as many good communication yeah i saw that and it they both went off without a hitch and mm-hmm. you guys made a couple corrections along the way to allow the vehicle to get pulled out which was really neat really mm-hmm. neat to see mm-hmm. and it looks like you you guys had a couple other accessories you had the you had the high lift and you had some look like roto packs for additional fuel. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yes, they are. Um, because we were right at the limits of the range of the gasoline cars. The diesels had no trouble with the route, but yeah, we I mean, towards the in limits. In the deep the- sand, uh, especially when you're on sand mode, uh, people are driving those cars enthusiastically, as you sure. saw in the river. The only fuel station that we've got on this whole trip is here in Apuo. Sure. So I have to have fuel dumps, as we call them at our overnight stops Uh and um, some of the journeys that we're doing are beyond the normal and there isn't a fuel station Mm -hmm. so we have to uh, carry everything with us and i saw that you guys also had some recovery boards on the on the rack as well have you started to use those more regularly uh yes especially in sand on the recce's you know when you've really got yourself and and one other vehicle not eight vehicles sure 
and they they work fantastically and they work both in mud and sand and yeah, you can use them for many, many things. And has that been a relatively recent addition or is or has Land Rover always used them, but they would just use the Marsden matting before? Tended historically to use the aluminium sand yeah, ladders sure. for a bolt, which are not particularly good for providing grit. They're, they're not, they're, yeah. You know, they, they, they have their purpose, but the, these new lightweight ones are, are fantastic. And, yeah, I think uh, they work really well. They're easy to extract from the sand when the car sort of buried them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they work really well. Yeah, it's so cool. Those for those that are listening too, we get the noises you can hear in the background. We've got some guinea fowl that's moving through the camp now, and and other bird life. It's just really, it's very cool to be in this location, this part of. Yeah, in fact, we've got a local cat just walk, walking by. This is a beautiful part of the world. Uh, what what inspires you? Because it looks like you're definitely trying to test the vehicle. But what are some of the characteristics that you're looking for when you're planning a route? Uh, for me, it has to be a journey. Uh, I'm sort of almost a little obsessive with it's got to be a journey. Doing loops out of places with no purpose. So mm-hmm. I look at the attributes of the vehicle, what we're trying to show, and then I go and find and keep searching till I find the routes that suit those attributes. Um, so it's, I mean, very difficult here to talk about on-road because sure. we've got no sealed surface. We've got about two kilometres of that. That's, that's it. Yeah. Um, and that's, Which I loved. Yeah. I so I don't great. think guys really believed me in the briefing when I said, <laughs> as soon as we go past the traffic lights, that's it for three days, no tarmac. Yeah. Um, but it, it that really was awesome. is true. That was awesome. Um, and it's about finding key features on that journey that test the vehicle out and allow you to test it in a real environment. Uh, I mean, I could build anything anywhere, but that wouldn't be authentic. Right. So everything is authentic. Yeah. And part of the journey is to see the views, the vistas, the people, uh, the wildlife. Um, and you do that by going to remote places. Because if you're on a on a on what I call a tourist trail, sure, uh, then you don't get quite the same experience. Um, and so Apuro is really the sort of most northerly place that people come to. There are very few people that go where we're taking you guys no question in, in fact van Zell's pass that we did a few days ago is considered a serious destination for overland travelers uh, people will come from around the world to have the opportunity to go experience that and it was quite technical and it's it certainly showcased the vehicle and we could see by the carcasses of other cars at the bottom of the hill <laughs> yes. that, yeah, there were, that there were people that, <laughs> people that didn't that didn't quite make well. it. Yeah. Either the vehicle wasn't suitable for it or the driver wasn't suitable for it. And that's a that's a reminder of where we, we were so remote that if we had had any really serious incident, that would be quite a bit to get somebody out. Yeah, and that's part of the planning that we put into it. So Lee, our medic, is traveling with us at all times. And he's, you know, looking after everything, the well-being of people, how people are feeling, if there are any insect bites, all that type of stuff. Sure. But also if something untoward was to take place, then we're, we're on it first point. Yeah. Sure. And, and then uh, the risk assessment. as well. So you've got your phones that reach yeah. out anywhere you are that can call help, get yeah. a helicopter in if needs be. And Emma, how do you interact with both like the first, the medical teams? Because it, it looks like you very much are focusing on wellness and the overall health of the group as well. Yeah, it's important to make sure everyone's you know drinking enough water, not too tired. Like three days driving is, is a lot. Driver changes regularly. Um, are people eating? And like we've got leave from a medical, you've got a bite or sure. anything like that. Whereas I'm a bit more... The other side are, you know, people talking to each other, getting out, stretching their legs. Yeah, so there's not an accident and everyone's looked after. And that is a good indicator. The one you just mentioned, are people talking to each other? I noticed that as people become more insular and they become more quiet, that usually is an indication of something else that's happening systemic, either within the group or within that individual. Once they start to be, they stop smiling, yeah. they stop communicating and talking with others they might be getting dehydrated they might be getting exhausted mm-hmm. and is that what you guys are looking for when you're yeah, out there yeah yeah and it's quite nice on that long stretch we did like yesterday where everyone is feeling a bit tired but we're all talking to each other and saying cows in the road or sure. watch out for this turn this dip and it's nice people are having to pick up the radio and you know oh, that's get smart thinking and so they don't get tired yeah yeah because some of the uh trips in a similar way like this, everything was on me for communication. Right. And, you know, uh, that, that's fine. But I, I did find that that didn't bring 
the younger members of the team on mm. in their skill set uh, because it's all a learning opportunity, as Emma's explained. Sure. And so we've all got a role. So Alex is our orator. Yeah. So he's giving you all the facts. He did and such figures. a great job. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, that allows me to concentrate on navigation and making sure, like, for example, in Skeleton Coast, we had the warden. And they're very concerned about what we're doing and where uh, you're going, where yeah. we're going. And so there's a constant communication mm. with her as she's in our car with us. And I'm feeding that out to the instructors to say, right, watch out for this, do that. And that allows Alex to talk about the stuff that's going on. And I'm sort of managing the ship in the background. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and you guys did, you guys did such a great job. <laughs> What are some things that, in addition to this particular trip, David, like, for example, around G4, what were some additional considerations that you had for the vehicles in those environments? I think it's really uh, ensuring that you understand the environments you're going into before you specify the vehicle. Because mm. obviously, we're a global car manufacturer. Mm. So do you want right-hand drive? Do you want left-hand drive? Uh, what features do you want on the car? You know, Do you want air conditioning? Do you not want air conditioning? Mm. Do you want petrol? Do you want diesel? Uh, as well as the sort of basic off-road features. Do you need a roof rack so you can put your kayak on? Do you want mm -hmm. a bike on? Do you need uh, recovery points? Do you need a tow bar? Sure. All of those things that you're going through the spec list, they're key to getting right in the first place. In all of the trips that you've done, what was your favorite trip that you've done for Land Rover in this regard? I think all of them are <laughs> favorites. Yeah. Uh, and we've got some very fond memories, as you heard Nick and I talking at dinner last right. night, from having to push that little bit further beyond the edge of what you would consider a normal office job to be, to make sure that we get you home. Because we don't know what's going to happen out there. Sure. So two days before you came here, massive, massive biblical rains. Rains, yeah. And that just took all the roots out of the river that we drove yesterday. So that river we were driving yesterday in November had grass little odd pulls to drive through and you saw how epic it was yesterday it was impressive yeah and that's me just sort of reading the ground well it's, it's sort of hard there it's soft there and occasionally you get it wrong but that creates this fantastic <clears throat> adventure that we've been on yeah you guys were doing 100 percent dead reckoning through that river yeah. mm. there was no <laughs> definable route through there no and it changes every day sure that, that's the key thing and uh <laughs> Matt, who's with me, hasn't done as much as we've done. And so I've got him driving. And so I suppose in a way I'm instructing him sure. as we go along because that builds the confidence. And it's like Emma is driving herself. Yes, okay, I've got the tick to go to Eastern, but actually she's learning every day, as she's explained. Yeah. Well, one of the things I noticed, Emma, was that you did a great job with brake modulation. Very <laughs> smooth. You were, you were, you did a great job. And that shows that the company has invested in your driving skills, which will just yeah. mean future expeditions for you. That's yeah. great. Well, that's the third time I'd come down that pass. Uh -huh. First time, nearly ran David over. <laughs> <laughs> but every time, and I just grow in confidence every time. And you just you can feel the car, and mm -hmm. you just it builds and builds and builds. It's yeah, it's a great feeling when you get to the bottom as well. <laughs> I mean, th this new vehicle, the Defender, has a character, and for me. If a car's got a character, it just makes me come alive. Yeah. And you just, you feel the passion and that, that it's infectious. Mm. And it infects our core team that takes you out, but it's infected all of the journalists that have been on mm -hmm. this trip with us. And when you arrive, you're all a bit jet lagged from the travel. Oh, on sure. day one, that's why I designed it. It was only four hours to get you dialed into the car and getting to know the routines yeah, and, and stuff. know each other as well which is quite important for you guys to chat for sure. amongst yourselves so you, you, you might have met your colleague but yeah we don't know who to put put you with when you no, arrive it's got, yeah. you know yeah, you, you might you have had an did. argument on a previous <laughs> launch or something <laughs> no it was everything was great you guys did a good job of curating the people that were there they were all hardy souls and they all they all love being in a bush camp and there was mm. no com there was no complaints that i heard it seemed like everybody was everybody was very very happy so and there's no point in putting out your your best opportunity for excitement on the first day. Yeah. Because then you've got two days of what's coming next. Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm a bit sort of, uh, I've finished now. Yeah, sure. So I like to get it to slowly build all the way through. And even that trip back from Sesfontaine back up to a pearl so yesterday fun. afternoon. So fun. <laughs> you know, it is a long way on those dusty roads. <clears throat> but as Emma says, the communication across the car with the comms and the 
It makes it fun. It makes it fun. It's a yeah. two-hour rally drive. I don't know what you're talking about. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Yes. Uh, no, no complaints at all. I mean, it was yeah. wonderful. And do you push on yeah. to allow the more enthusiastic, capable drivers? Sure. And, but I've got to take the whole right. convoy with me. Uh, so, yeah, it's, no, it, was, it was great. It's Which, a slight relief when you come in <clears throat> unscathed, <laughs> unscathed <laughs> into town. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, you have, since you've been with Land Rover for 40 years, you've probably owned a lot of Land Rover your, yourself. Do you have any idea how many Land Rovers you've personally owned? Uh, obviously, hopefully my wife's not listening. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they were all free. Let's go with that. <laughs> well, she calls it my orphanage. <laughs> so they find me. They yeah. find me. So... I mean, it's, it's probably over over 40, I should think, yeah, over sure. the full length of my career. But currently, it's it's only eight. How many? What are the Land Rovers you have now? Uh, three Series 1s, Series 2, Series 3, Defender 90, uh, uh, two Range Rovers, a three-door and an LSE. Oh, a three-door. Beautiful. What yeah. year is your three-door? My three-door is 72. Oh, jeez. Yeah, year of my birth. Uh, and then uh, I also have a... Uh, a TVR. Everything's got a V8 in it. That's, 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 <laughs> that's the one that's, requirement? That's the one requirement. Uh, that's nice. Now, so in all of those years, what would you say is your favorite, your personal favorite Land Rover? If for some reason you had, you could only own one, let's exclude the current models just to make it easier for you that, to... That makes it a lot easier. Yeah. I think for all round capability, comfort, usability, look, feel has to be my three-door classic Range Rover. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Uh, I mean, I love my series trucks, but that, you know, I know my wife and children would be quite happy to go on a massive journey in it because it's comfortable, it's roomy, mm -hmm. it takes everything. And and they're beautiful. Yeah, and I I remember when they first came out, I, I was at school and a parent had bought one and they brought it to the sort of end of term cricket match and they had a picnic out of the boat and that it was a blue one and that's just ingrained in my brain <sighs> that blue was beautiful too it was yeah, so i've always it. always wanted one and <clears throat> as soon as i could afford one i bought one i mean it was a nail but it was there and then you restored it yourself uh no not really it's sort of uh, we carried on and went on you know did boys things with it <laughs> <laughs> sure it, it uh, didn't survive that long but i knew i had to get another one. So, oh okay yeah. so that's what you so have, now, have the current it? one Ooh, yeah, probably about 12 years now. Oh, good for you. That's wonderful. Yeah. And Emma, what's your favorite Land Rover? Our current range, uh, Range Rover Sport. And you like the Range Rover Sport. Which motor in that one? Really? It's going to be a supercharger. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, who cares how much no. fuel, fuel costs, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just a good looking car. Yeah. And of yeah. the older Land Rovers, which ones are your favorites? Oh, I don't know. Probably the same. So they're just just great cars yeah, and I range. haven't driven a lot of the older range um, but we've done we've got our classic centre so sat we, in a few we did a drive for the 70th anniversary yeah. uh, which we we were given the opportunity to go into both classic uh, and heritage and get out our, it was like a sort of dream list and we put all of this together and we yeah. did a drive was, for a yeah. number of journalists ar around sure. Solihull and stuff and I think it's really important to take uh, our new uh, intake into the business through that lineage so we have grads that come and mm -hmm. have placement from engineering with us which is an old contact and they come into our department and they've never done anything like that before it's a whole other world to whole another world to them but that's you know once they've got their head around it that that we've left them with an experience for life and they're taking that back into engineering and that's all being fed back into the new cars and you've been with Land Rover for so long that how do you feel that connection still to the past? Do you feel that throughout the organization, that acknowledgement of the past? It sure seems like that Land Rover respects so much of its heritage. Yes. I, I think you have to be very careful with it Yeah, because uh, you have to move on. Yeah, And if we're entrenched in the past, then we wouldn't be alive if that's the right term sure. to use today. Yeah. So you've got to be cognizant of what's happened in the past yeah it wouldn't but, even be legal to sell a series one <laughs> discovery or a series one no. land rover today it wouldn't even pass any of the safety requirements but right? also you'd be ignorant if you didn't look back at some of the excellent innovation that's taken place and mm. uh re-evolve that into what you see today parked outside that's yeah, effectively sure. what's there 
yeah, lots of learning sure. and passion has gone into that new car, mm. which is why it's got this character. And what, what kind of advice would you give someone that was just about, they just recently bought a Land Rover and they want to go do a significant trip like this. What kind of advice would you give them? What would be the first thing that you would tell someone if they came to you and said, David, I just bought a new Defender and I want to go to Namibia. What would be the first piece of advice you'd give them? Research, read. You can't just walk into a shop, buy it and go and do it. Yeah. So it's about preparation. So research, preparation, and that's preparation of vehicle and people, as we sure. talked about earlier in this podcast. Yeah, get some get some training, et cetera. Yeah. And go and talk to a number of people. Don't go to one perceived expert mm. uh, because they've got their own view and their own experiences. But if you look at the breadth of experience across the ride, there are many people that love to talk about things. Mm. Um, but you, you've got to see people that have actually delivered. And, and they've done it. For me. Yeah, they've that done they've it. done it. And how about you, Emma? What what advice would you give to someone that was planning their first trip from the things that you've learned with Land Rover? What would you what advice would you give people around planning and logistics? I'd, I'd say preparation, again, is absolutely key. But you can plan, plan, plan and things can still not go the way you want want it to go. I mean, this is Africa. Right. <laughs> and right. things are gonna <laughs> things are gonna come out not work quite how you, you think in your head. So I think it's all about staying pretty calm, not flapping or stressing. And I think that's one of the key things I've learned to just keep my cool and problem solve where you can. Oh, that makes but sense. Yeah. Things yeah, things aren't gonna go always to, to how you, you jump there would be. But yeah, staying calm, problem solve, speaking to the team. I mean, we've got so many years of experience here and I'm learning every day from the guys mm. I'm here with. So yeah, just keeping you cool. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, we have to plan so that way we don't invite too many problems. But once we start the trip, we have to just kind of let the rest of it go and take it as it comes mm -hmm. or else we become so obsessed with sticking to a plan or a certain outcome that we, we yeah. forget to stop. And you'll forget to enjoy it yeah, if you're thinking, it. oh, we're a bit late or, you know, we didn't go this way. It's, it's not always going to be perfect, but you never know what you might find on the way doing something else. It could be even better. So. Like stopping in that little village and interacting with the locals and buying some bracelets. And yeah. I mean, they were beautiful people. And that yeah. if we hadn't stopped, we would have missed that rich moment. Yeah. But that, that's part of the journey. So it when is. I ran into that place on my reccees, I thought, this is beautiful. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't want to stop because, oh, I, I'm, I'm concerned about interacting. And so you've got to encourage people to do that to, to be brave and step outside their comfort because then their journey becomes even richer um, yeah those memories and and i think the key thing about coming to places like africa and it's the same wherever you go is you've got to respect the local culture and it's all about people connections mm. um, and so i spend a lot of time getting to know the local processes and talking to key players to make sure that what we're trying to do is acceptable to them from a cultural point of view because you know big company like Land Rover coming into town yes okay we're putting a lot of uh, income in back in because that's very important to us as well but when we leave we want them to invite us back yeah. that, that's a key key thing for me and you yeah and we all want them to have as positive a, of an experience as we have and I think as tourists oftentimes they can get this idea that they're and they don't recognize it, but they're really taking a lot mm -hmm. and they're not giving as much back. So stopping and shaking someone's hand. Like John hand. was saying the other night, yeah. that, you know, speak to these people because they, they want, they wanted to talk, interact with you. Yeah. It was really, that was really neat just to stop and shake their hand and smile and, and interact with them, ask them how their day is mm -hmm. and things like that. That's but also really with the special. travelers. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we did that. We yeah. met those other guys in the, in the gorge. Yeah. Uh, and they were just blown away. They loved it. By, <laughs> what, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> uh, so that's, you've got to build relationships. You do. Because you, you then are able to get a lot more out of them because they, they sort of relax and they tell you about things, which then make it a richer experience for us as well. Yeah, so agree. David and Emma, thank you both so much for the time. I 
I admire so much what you both do. And I was able to experience firsthand the results of your professionalism and your skills and many of the, not only the vehicles you've talked about, David, but the other trips like G4 and everything else were so formative to my passion, not only for Land Rover, but for vehicle-based travel that I thank you and all of those that have come before you that have done so much to inspire those of us that want to go see the world. So thank you both for your time this morning. It's a great pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.